today I'm going to discuss with you one of the interesting consequences of Faraday's law. Not so intuitive, but that's the way it is. Bear with me, because many people have problems with this concept. In 1982, Romer published an article in the American Journal of Physics in December 1982. And in that article, he showed a circuit. You see that circuit here? Solenoid in the middle, in this direction, R1 resistor, R2 resistor, a voltmeter here and a voltmeter there, V2 here and V1 there. And he wrote, you may be able to read it, the predicted voltmeter readings at first seem puzzling. In particular, two identical voltmeters connected to the same two points in the circuit will not show identical readings. The theoretical predictions are confirmed by simple experiments. The theoretical predictions are Maxwell's equations, in this case, largely Faraday's law. So read this once more, the key sentence. Two identical voltmeters connected to the same two points in the circuit will not show identical readings. We now summarize that for people who have had some education in physics. In the case of an induced EMF, because this solenoid there produces an induced EMF in the circuit, in the case of an induced EMF, potentials are no longer determined. Potential differences depend on the path. If it's difficult for your stomach, it's too bad. But that's the way it is. It's the result of Faraday's law. The closed loop integral of E dot TL is minus d phi dt. Phi is the magnetic flux. You have to attach to the closed loop an open surface. Could be flat, but it can also like a paper bag. It's open on one side, you can put your hand in. And if that magnetic flux changes in time, divide dt, then you induce in that circuit an EMF and a current will start to flow. And that is arguably the most important contribution made to mankind of all time. And the reason why I say that is that Faraday's law runs our entire economy because because of Faraday's law we can now convert chemical energy when we burn coal, when we burn oil, when we use nuclear energy, we can convert that into electricity. All power stations work only because of Faraday's law. I have here an example. You see this dynamo? I do work. I want the woman I'm doing work. And I can convert that to electricity. And that is only because of Faraday's law. Okay. I assume that either I or some of my graduate students or some of my associates read this paper by Rome and we decided and I'll be very honest I do not even remember having read that paper but I might have and we decided to follow Homer's suggestion and he said the theoretical predictions which are of course trivial 
are confirmed by simple experiments. So we decided to do that simple experiment. And we built something that is identical to what Homer suggested. If you look at my lecture number 16 of 802, it's on the web, it's on my YouTube channel, you will see at the end I discuss this demonstration and I perform the demonstration. And I convincingly show that indeed the two voltmeters read different values. A large difference, as large as you want it, but they are even reverse polarities. Yeah. And the reason for all this, as I said, is Faraday's law. When the phi dt is not zero, there is a non-conservative electric field that you produce. And when you have non-conservative fields, then whatever you measure depends on the path. Gravitational fields are conservative. So when you go from point A to point B, the amount of work you have to do with a certain mass is always the same, whether you go this from A to B, or whether you go this from A to B, or whether you go this from A to B. But that is no longer the case when you have non-conservative fields. And that's the case here with induced EMFs. They produce non-conservative electric fields. So in 1984, which was only two years after this was published, I did for the first time at MIT, in my lecture 16, this demo. Stunning success. <laughs> yes, it was really a remarkable result and people have sent comments to me all over the world how wonderful it was. But only people at MIT could see it. In 2002, I lectured again ENM at MIT, and those lectures were videotaped. And in 2004, they went to OCW, Open Courseware. That means anyone in the world who had internet could see them. All hell broke loose. You can't believe the mails that I received. I remember one person, I don't remember his name, but I still remember that he was Dutch, or he still is Dutch. He told me that the idea that two voltmeters, identical voltmeters, connected to the same two points in a circuit, always must read the same value. He was religiously obsessed by that. And he also told me he was going to prove it. He was going to do a video, and he was going to post that video. I have never seen the video, but some of my graduate students have. Of course, whatever he did, I do not know. But just imagine for a minute, suppose he could have proven that the two values, V1 and V2, were the same in the case of this demo. That he would have basically said, in simple terms, that Maxwell, Maxwell's equations don't work. He would say that Faraday's law is wrong, which is equivalent to saying the Earth is flat. So if any one of you have ever seen that video, you see a striking example that if you're obsessed enough about a wrong idea, yeah, you can make a video about it. There are also videos, videos about proof that the Earth is flat. Similar thing. Before we continue, I advise you to read the lecture notes of my lecture 20 and lecture 16. That will greatly help you in whatever comes now. Look at this circuit. 
This is a silicon wire, has a resistance of 14 ohms and it's 30 centimeters long. This is also a silicon wire, wire, the same length, both are 30 centimeters long, but this one has a higher resistance, 140 ohms. You can look up what the thickness of those wires will have to be to get these values. Uh, the thickness here is about two and a half millimeters and the diameter, and the diameter here is about 3.2 times higher, it's about eight millimeters. So both are silicon wires. I put a battery in there, 10 volt battery, and the battery reads EMF 10 volts. That's my battery that I buy. The internal resistance of this battery is extremely low, it may be less than 0.1 ohm. For now you may forget about that as far as I'm concerned. It has no effect on whatever follows. I attach a voltmeter here, I call that V2. I call this side R2 and this side R1. I attach here a voltmeter to this point and to that point, and here a voltmeter to this point and to that point. I call this one V1 and this one V2. This is the plus side, this is the minus side of the voltmeter, this is the plus side and this is the minus side. What is the current going through that system? Well, Ohm's law, right? Simple as that. So the total resistance in this circuit, by the way, these dotted lines, in reality, are, are wires, of course, right? with extremely low resistances, but I dotted them because I like to dot it. So, the current going through this system, Ohm's law, 10 volts divided by R1 plus R2, which is 154 ohms, and so you get this is going to be the current. I gave you more digits than would really be necessary or even reasonable. So this voltmeter would read plus 9.09090 volts, and this voltmeter would read plus 0.90909 volts. Everyone is happy. Faraday is happy. Because the phi dt is zero. There are no changing magnetic fields. Magnetic fluxes, I should say. And so, indeed, if you add these two up, you get the, the 10 volt EMF. No problem. I want you to realize that if you had measured the potential difference between this point and that point, whether you would go this route or whether you would go through the battery this route, in both cases you would have found the same value. Because the electric fields are conservative and therefore the potential difference in an electric circuit are independent of the path. That's very key. If the phi dt is zero, that is always true. Now hold on to your chair. I'm going to remove the battery. I call this point A now and I call this point D. And I'm now following the advice by Homer. And that's my lecture 16, by the way, on <laughs> able to. In here is a solenoid, this solenoid, which is, uh, in my case, it's about this long. You know, it sticks out in this direction, about 15 centimeters, and it is in, in the board, so to speak, also 15 centimeters. I arranged the situation such, which for now is rather arbitrary and artificial, but I will remove the artificiality. For now let us assume that I can do this in such a way that the magnetic flux change remains constant just for a few seconds. 
I want to make sure that my voltmeters have time to react. So I keep it constant for a few seconds. And the EMF that is produced because of that solenoid, which I power, I power that solenoid with an external power supply. So the d 5 dt in this cross circuit is 10 volts. It's also, of course, 10 volts in this closed one. However, and this is key, it's also mentioned by Romo, of course, it's arranged in such a way that the magnetic flux change in this closed loop is so low that you can ignore it. So yes, there is a d phi dt in a surface which would be a flat surface here or a paperback surface, but that is not the case here and that is also not the case there. However, there is an EMF, of course, in this circuit and in this one. But not here and not there. So in this closed loop, Faraday's law says that the closed loop integral E dot L is zero. In this closed loop, it's also zero. But in here, it is 10 volts. And I assume that I can hold that for a while, 10 volts. Well. What is the current? The current is the 10 volts EMF, the induced EMF divided by the total resistance. That is 154 ohms. So this is the current. So V2 will read a value plus 9.0999 and V1 will read plus 0.9099. You may see happy because the sum of those two yeah, it's 10 volts, so you would say, well, what, what's the problem? Hang on to your chair! Hold on to your chair, you're going to fall off your chair. Ready? Va minus Vd, if I go clockwise, the potential difference between point A and point D, which is the integral of E dot dl along this line, is plus 9.0909 volts. But the potential difference between A and D going this way is not only negative, because this is the negative side and this is the positive side, and I measure plus 0.909, so therefore, I measure plus 0.909, so therefore it means that this point has a higher potential than this point. And therefore, this point has a lower potential than that one. So VA minus VD in this direction is minus 0.91. And you better believe it, that is indeed what the voltmeters show. So if you put plus and minus here the way I did, the voltmeter would read plus 0.9. But what I do in my experiments, I call this the plus side of the voltmeter and this the minus side. And the reason why I do that, because this is also plus to minus, and if this is also plus to minus, it's only fair if I go from A to D that I go through the voltmeters in the same direction. But it's, it's, it's a minor detail. If you do that, if you call this the plus side of the voltmeter and this the minus sign, you will immediately read, and that's the way I do my experiment in lecture 16, you will read that one voltmeter reads the plus value, in this case plus 9, and the other voltmeter will show you minus 0.9. Yeah. In the case of an induced EMF, the potential difference between two points is not determined. It depends on the path. Staring you in the face. 
I will now go back to my experiment lecture 16. And the reason for that is that my solenoid is producing a changing magnetic field, a changing magnetic flux, but it's not always the same. The value d phi dt is not always the same. And this is a reason why you may want to watch lecture 16. So the solenoid is driven like an RL system. If you want to refresh your knowledge on how RL system works, when you power them with a DC battery, you can either again watch my lecture 20, or you can watch the video that I published just a few days ago. The current going through the solenoid will start with zero because of the self-inductance, which is the solenoid itself of the electromagnet. So the current will go like this, and therefore the B field that it produces will also go like this. There comes a time that there is no longer any change in the current, so the IDT is zero, so the BDT is zero, and then, of course, there is no longer any change in the magnetic field. And if there is no longer any change in the magnetic field, then Faraday's law says, well, sorry, then, <laughs> then there is no longer any induced EMF. So if you wait a little bit, there is no longer induced MEF, and the magnetic field that you generate with the solenoid when you <coughs> power it, goes down this way. In my video a few days ago, I had it in terms of current. Now I have it in terms of magnetic field. The magnetic field changes in terms of 1 minus e to the power r over L times t. r is the resistance of the solenoid, and L is the self-inductance of the solenoid. Again, if you rush through all this, look at my lecture number 20. Or the video that I posted a few days ago. The reason why I put a mark here, that to my sign, in the video that I marked, that I put up a few days ago, I had, unfortunately, a plus sign there. Of course, I had the curve right, but I slipped up on this sign. So that's why I want to remind you it's a minus sign. Now, in lecture 16, from here to here, is only about 10 milliseconds. So when I power the solenoid, after 10 milliseconds the show is all over. It's gone. So there's no longer any EMF. So the voltmeters 1 and the voltmeters 2 will also change in time. However, the ratio between the two will always be R2 over R1 and always with a minus sign. In my case, R2 was nine times larger than R1. And so at all moments in time during those 10 milliseconds, the value of V2 is always nine times larger than the value of V1. And they have reverse polarities. And I demonstrate that during my lecture, at the end of lecture 16, and you can see that. You can see that in a way that is... I, I tell my students, look closely because what you are going to see now you may never again see in your life and you may want to tell your grandchildren about it. So, one voltmeter, V2, shows the plus value, which I... I have a time resolution of my voltmeters with our oscilloscope of half a millisecond. So at half a millisecond intervals I can show the class what the value of V2 is and what the value of V1 is. Always a factor of nine difference and the polarity is reversed.
I will teach you a little bit more physics. But for that I have to change the battery of my video camera because it runs out of power after about 20 minutes. And the 20 minutes are up. Hey, you hear, you hear my alarm clock? So I'm going to change the battery and then I will teach you some more physics. This is also very intriguing and it's related in a way. So hold on to your chair. I'll be back as shortly as I can. Okay, I just watched the video that I produced and I noticed that it's not so easy in the start, at the start of the video, to read the text of Homer. So therefore, I have a close-up for you and we will read it together. The predicted voltmeter readings at first seem puzzling. In particular, two identical voltmeters connected to the same two points in the circuit will not show identical readings. The theoretical predictions are confirmed by simple experiments. The theoretical predictions, which I did in my lecture 16, simple applications of Faraday's law, are confirmed by experiment. Read it again. Two identical voltmeters connected to the same two points in the circuit will not show identical readings. And in the case of my experiment, the ratio of the two are nine, but also the polarities are reversed. One more thing which I noticed on my video that I mentioned to you that in my previous video of a few days ago that I had this minus sign rule. <laughs> Actually, this I had right, but it was this minus sign for which I had a plus sign. Small detail, it is correct here. So I'm now going to pursue, going to change the battery of my video camera and some more very nice physics is coming up. Not so intuitive either. All right. I <laughs> changed the battery. So I have more time. I mentioned earlier that I do not remember that I read that 1982 article by Romer All I know is that we built an experiment there at MIT, which is quite similar. I had even forgotten completely this 1982 article. Francis Benedict, one of my viewers, reminded me of that 1982 article a few days ago, and I want to thank him for that. But of course, I'm sure I was driven in 1984 and my colleagues at MIT by that article. Now comes an interesting question. What and where is this EMF in the system? And how can we possibly meet Maxwell's requirements, Maxwell's equations. I suggest you read my lecture notes of lecture 20. That's why I discuss it. And so what I discuss now is not really new, but it may be new for many of you who have not carefully studied my lecture notes of lecture 20.
So remember, this side was 140 ohms and this side was 14 ohms. The same current is obviously through both. We know that the potential difference in this direction is plus 9. And that means that the electric field must be the potential difference divided by the length, that is 30 centimeters, so that is 30.3 volts per meter. That must be the E field in here. That is non-negotiable. That must be the final E field here. The final E field here on the left is 10 times lower. We, we discussed that in detail, right? Because that's the ratio of the resistances. So, the E field in this portion must be 3.03 .03 volts per meter. The induced EMF, that is our 10 volts, divided by the length of the whole thing. So that is 16.667 volts per meter. If you had a battery, if you put a battery in this system, there is absolutely no problem to have the same current going through both. Since the resistances are different, to have different E fields. But we do not have a battery. We do not have a battery. Therefore, we have introduced non-conservative E-fields. That's the induced E-field. So now comes the question, how can Maxwell do all this without a battery? Before I give you the answer, which is in my lecture notes of lecture 20, you may want to know, although it's not all that interesting, that there have been some discussions back and forth about people who said, oh, the EMF is here, or the EMF is there, no, the EMF is really in the wires, which have almost no resistance. And even I <laughs> am guilty of that. Because I mentioned in one of my solutions of a physics problem, also in the video I think that I posted a week ago, that I posted that the EMF clearly has to be larger at the location which has the highest ohmic resistance than at areas which have a lower ohmic resistance. That's wrong, that's not true. So what I said, and what many other people have also said, is wrong, and I apologize for that. If I had only <laughs> checked my own lecture notes of lecture 20, I would certainly not have said it. Okay, so be that, be that as it may, let us now see how nature solves the problem without a battery. Look here. The induced EMF is 16.667. The induced EMF is not here, is not here, is not here, is not there. Okay? The induced EMF is here. Here. Here is the induced EMF. Here. You cannot put your finger on it. It is here when you go around. That EMF is 16.667 volts per meter. How now is it possible that the E field on the right side is 30.3 and that the E field on the left side is 3.03? .03? And here comes the brilliance of Mother Nature. The brilliance, yeah. Right here and right here, real charge builds up. Plus Q charge here and minus Q there. 
And these charges produce an E-field that in, on the left side is down, and on the right side it's also down. These are all to God charges. And these Q's just will get the right value so that the E vectors that we measure are as they are. So when you look here, for instance, at the right side, the induced value is 16.667 volts per meter, the E field. Remember, the total circumference is 60 centimeters, and we have 10 volts, so the induced EMF is 16.667. On the right side, we know we have 30.30, that's non-negotiable. Therefore, it is the 16.667 plus the E-field that is produced by these two charges in this direction. So you have to add them, because they are dumb. And the E-field here is, induced E-field is also dumb. So therefore, this number must be 16.67 plus that E-field produced by the charges. Let's now go to the left side. There is an induced E-field in, in upwards direction that is non-negotiable. That is 16.67. Yet, we only measure 3.03. .03. Ah, but the E-field due to the plus charge and the minus charge is in down direction. And therefore, the 3.030 must be the 16.667 in this direction minus the E field due to the charges. You can solve this equation and you can solve this equation and you will find that in both cases you find that the electric field due to the charge here and there is about 13.633 volts per meter. That is not discussed in any college physics book that I have seen, except, of course, when you get Jackson and Purcell, I'm sure, does it right, too. This is hidden. And since it's hidden, people really never learn it properly. But then they have wild ideas going back to the days of high school somehow. Namely, when you measure with two voltmeters, identical voltmeters, between two and the same point in a circuit, clearly V1 has to be V2. How can it not be? Well, the reason why it cannot be is because of Faraday's law. You won't believe how many messages I have received ever since my lectures went online with open courseware. Hundreds, perhaps even thousands. And during the time that I am on YouTube, hundreds, even today there were many, <laughs> who said, uh, Walter Lewin, I'm sorry, but you were a good teacher, but you were wrong. The two voltmeters must read the same thing. Perhaps you remember Shakespeare's Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. The title of this video will be To Agree or Not to Agree is not what matters. What matters is whether you understand Maxwell's equations, whether you understand Faraday's law, and whether you know how to use it. I realize that many of you find this difficult. It is one of the most difficult parts of Ego 2 at first year college level. The rumor has it, that it's only a rumor, that 
there is a person who says he has a master's degree in electrical engineering. And that person, according to some of my former students, makes the following statement. I will give you a close-up shortly on that, but I will read it to you now. The entire reason Dr. Lewin was reading two different voltages was due to bad probing. <laughs> if it's really true that he has a master's degree in electrical engineering and makes such a ridiculous statement, then you shouldn't feel so bad anymore. Because if someone with a master's degree in electrical engineering doesn't understand Faraday's law, well, you are forgiven for also not understand Faraday's law. Do me one favor though, because I have not been able to find that video, and it may not even exist. Can you try to find that video? And can you then confirm that that person spoke the words the entire reason Dr. Lewin was reading two different voltages was due to bad probing. And let me know whether he really said that. What he's basically saying, but so many others have been saying, equivalent to saying the Earth is flat. You can continue discussions about this, about the issue which is non-negotiable, that in the case of an induced EMF, potentials are no longer determined and potential differences in a circuit depend on the path. It's non-negotiable. But you can discuss it as long as you want to on my YouTube channel. However, you have to forgive me that I will not contribute to your debates or your discussions. I already stopped answering questions related to this within a year that my lectures were on open courseware. At best what I may do is simply send you a copy of this video and maybe also a copy of my lecture notes of lecture 20 and maybe also lecture 16. You may say you're a bad teacher because a good teacher would debate these issues with us. Well, there are certain things I don't debate. <laughs> I don't debate with people something which is so very basic physics, like Faraday's law, neither do I debate with people whether the Earth is flat or not flat. If you're angry at me now, if you don't want to be friends with me, I will forgive you for that. My task is to teach you correct physics. And if the result of that is that many of you don't want to be friends with me, that's okay. I will accept that. That is the price I have to pay. So, have a nice day, take care, and I'll try to zoom in on that totally absurd statement, which of course is only a rumor, I'm not even sure that the person ever said this. I hope you can read it.
and it's even nice to read it in connection with the words by Romer, who stated very clearly the opposite. <laughs> All right, so we will end. We will end with two readings, if I can do that. Yeah, we will end with two readings. Two identical voltmeters connected to the same two points in the circuit will not show identical readings. And then comes this absurd statement by someone who claims he has a master's degree in electrical engineering. The entire reason Dr. Lewin was reading two different voltages was due to bad programming.